What's up everybody? So in this video we're going to be talking about everything that you need to know for D3.2 HL. Most students feel and look like this bear when they're studying this topic, but I hope after this video you don't look or feel like this bear anymore and that everything makes sense. I'm going to do my best, so just sit back, relax, and enjoy. Now, as usual, go check out teachme.org for tons and tons of IB style questions. We have mock exams there now and super sexy notes. Teachme.org is going to be your parachute that's going to carry you over the finish line for this exam. So without further ado, guys, let's just get started. For this video to make perfect sense, we need to take a step back and look at some of the basics. Remember, nearly all of the cells in our body, except for sperm and egg, contain 46 chromosomes. 46 chromosomes, specifically 23 pairs. So if you look at this karyogram here, there is pair one all the way to the last pair, pair 23. Now for each pair, remember, we have one copy from our mother and one copy from our father. That's very important to understand. Now, when we take a look at our karyogram, we have genes located all over on all of these chromosomes. So we may have a gene here, a gene right below there, a gene below here, a gene on this chromosome here, a gene over here. There's genes everywhere located on these chromosomes. Remember that. Now, the thing is, this is the case for almost all of our cells. Now, when we want to reproduce, right, we need to make a sperm cell if you're a male or an egg cell if you're a female. Now, the process that um, is responsible for doing that is meiosis, right, meiosis. Now, by carrying out meiosis one and two, we manage to form um, a sperm or an egg cell. And how, there's, how does a sperm or an egg cell's karyogram look different? Remember, the one way in which it's different is that it's exactly half. Instead of having two copies per chromosome pair, now we only have one. For each chromosome, we only have one. One, two, three, all the way down. That's the big difference. These guys, sperm and egg cells, they're called gametes or sex cells. These cells are special because they are haploid. Remember, haploid means they contain half the amount of DNA compared to all the other cells in our body. So we put here N because they only have one copy of each chromosome pair. Whereas all the other cells in our body, we call them diploid or 2N because for each chromosome pair, they have two copies, one from the mother and one from the father. That's the big thing we need to understand here. And that's important because when we have now this sperm and this egg that contains half the DNA compared to a normal cell, when they fertilize each other, right, during reproduction, and they combine their DNA together, now we have a zygote. And we have a cell now that has the normal amount of DNA, this amount, right, 46 chromosomes, because 23 plus 23 is 46. And that cell, that zygote, that stem cell, will divide and divide and form your entire body. Now, Remember this, meiosis 1 and meiosis 2 is covered in detail in a separate chapter of IB Biology. But for this video to make sense, we need to recap two very important things that happen in meiosis 1 and meiosis 2 that will make this video so, so much easier to understand. Remember, during meiosis 1, we have something, two things that happen that are super important to remember. Crossing over and independent assortment. The process of meiosis starts with a stem cell. For the simplicity of this overview, we're only going to show it using one chromosome pair. But remember, we have 23 chromosome pairs. Now for each pair, so we're going to use one pair here, you have one copy from the mother and one copy from the father. So the color here is just to denote mother copy and father copy. Now before this cell goes into meiosis, it first duplicates its DNA. So that now you have two copy of the mother's and two copy of the father's DNA for that chromosome. Once this is completed, this cell can go into meiosis 2 and divide. Each daughter cell will contain one homologous chromosome. Now, both of these cells will undergo meiosis 2, each of them dividing into two cells. Now, instead of homologous chromosomes separating, like what happened in meiosis 1, now the sister chromatids will separate into cells. So now we end up with these sex cells. I used the example of sperm, but obviously the same thing goes for egg. So now we ended up with these gametes that each contain half the amount of DNA compared to the original cell. That is the overview of meiosis. During meiosis, two very important phenomena happen. One, crossing over, and two, independent assortment. 
Crossing over happens during prophase one. Okay, at this point, we have the duplicated DNA that look like this. Now, crossing over is a phenomenon where the mother's copy will exchange DNA with the father's copy, right? So basically, genes will be switched and switched over, crossed over. That's what crossing over is. Now, this ends up having this effect. So now, instead of having two copies of your of pure your father's DNA and two copies of pure your mother's DNA, now you would have caused crossing over. So now you form these chromatids that are actually unique because now this chromatid, for example, is a little bit of a mix between your mother and your father's DNA. That's what that's the effect that crossing over causes, and that's important because without this, our Gametes that we make would be very similar to your parents' DNA because look, this one has just your mother's copy and your mother's copy and this is your father's copy and your father's copy. But because of crossing over, we can form these gametes that are actually pretty unique for having um, chromosomes that are a mix, a blend between the mother and the father's DNA, between the mother and the father's genes. Independent assortment also happens during meiosis one. To explain independent assortment, we're going to have to use two chromosome pairs. For this example of crossing over, we only needed one pair, but for independent assortment to make sense, we have to use two. So we're going to use chromosome pair one and chromosome pair five, because why not? So here we have it. So here we have a cell now at this stage, but instead of one chromosome pair, we're using two. So the, do, the DNA, so let's say this right here, is the homologous chromosome one. So you can see they're duplicated, like, like here. Um, two mother copies and two father copies, but now we also have homologous chromosome 5. The mother uh, DNA is duplicated and the father's DNA is duplicated. Now, during prophase 1, the chromosomes, the homologous chromosomes, they line up in the nucleus because they're getting ready to split by meiosis 1. Now, the fashion in which they line up is random. Um, it could be like this, where the dad's DNA is on the left for both homologous chromosome 5 and 1, um, and the mother is on the right. But it could also be different. It could be like this, where for homologous chromosome 1, the mother's DNA lines up on the left and the father's on the right. See, in this case, that's a different uh, way in which they can line up. So this is random, the way in which they line up. Now, let's assume they line up like this. What will be the outcome? Following meiosis 1, we form two cells now that look like this. So these two, the mother copies, split into one cell, and the father's copies split into one cell. Because remember, the father's copies lined up on the same side, so they will go to the same cell. And the same concept goes for the mother's copies. Now we have these two, these two cells, right? These two. Now meiosis 2 is going to happen. Meiosis 2 both of these will now split and the sister chromatids will separate. These two sister chromatids will go to one cell. These two will go to another cell. And the same is going to go for this cell here. So then we manage to form after meiosis 1 and meiosis 2, four cells that have this genetic combination. Now, if the um, arrangement or the way in which these chromosomes lined up during prophase 1 was different, let's say like this, now let's see how the outcome changes because now after meiosis one we're not going to have this arrangement we're going to have a different arrangement look because the mother's copy now lined up on the left and the father's on the right now these two homologous chromosome one this one the mom's the father's copy and the mother's copy for for chromosome 5, these two are going to one cell and the other two are going to one cell so that's why we will form this outcome now both of these will undergo meiosis too and form these four cells. So you can see simply um, depending on the way in which these chromosomes line themselves up during prophase one will influence the um, genetic combination that is formed after meiosis one and meiosis two. So we can clearly see this sperm will get the mother's copy for chromosome one but the father's copy for chromosome 5, whereas this sperm will get both mother's copies for chromosome 1 and chromosome 5. So really, depending on the arrangement, the, the way they line up during prophase 1, that will actually influence what sperm you can form, what genetic combinations of sperm you can form. Now imagine if we combine both independent assortment and crossing over, 
the amount of unique combinations of sperm you can make. Because when we talk here about independent assortment, we didn't even consider crossing over. But remember, crossing over happens at the same time. You guys must also be aware of this law by Gregor Mendel. Each gamete will only receive one of the two copies that the parents can give. Remember, this is a gamete, a sex cell, and it only contains one copy from the parent. Remember, the parent had a copy from the mother and the father, but it contains only one copy. And that's okay, because when it combines with another copy from the egg, then we form a normal cell. So just remember this little law. It's not too important, just a little vocab word. The big focus of higher level is to learn everything about dihybrid crosses. So before we dive into those details, let's quickly review monohybrid crosses that we covered in SL. This is gonna be a really quick recap just to refresh your memory. So a monohybrid cross is when we mate two parents for one gene to see what possible combinations their offspring will have. So let me, let me, let's use an example here of um, a plant. So let's say this is the, um, the a chromosome of a plant, the mother copy and the father copy. And let's say this gene here codes for the bean shape of this plant, the bean shape. Now a bean shape can either be round or smooth or wrinkled. So smooth, round or wrinkled. That's dependent on its on, on, on what its gene alleles are. So we know there are two possible alleles. There are smooth or wrinkled. The smooth one is the dominant allele and we denote it with a capital B. And then the wrinkled one is the recessive allele which we denote with lowercase b because it's weaker. So the possible genotypes a plant can have are these three. And then the phenotypes will be like this. We saw this idea in standard level. Now, a monohybrid cross is to take two parents and, and uh, mate them to see what possible offsprings their kids will have. So here is a monohybrid cross. We have one parent here, let's say this is the one parent's allele combination, big B, small b, and the other parent happens to have the same allele combination. Now with a Punnett square or Punnett grid, we can see the possible offspring combinations, and then we can write the percentages of these genotypes and these phenotypes. That's a monohybrid cross. A monohybrid cross is a cross or a mating involving only a single gene. We only consider this bean shape gene, no other genes. That's a monohybrid cross. A dihybrid cross is basically the same thing, only now we're considering two genes at once. So a dihybrid cross is when we cross two parents for two genes to see the possible outcomes in their offspring. Now, Remember this karyogram, we said that genes are located everywhere, right? Everywhere on these chromosomes. Now, what we need to know is that genes can either be linked or unlinked. And we're gonna talk about what this means now. So what does linked mean? So let's say we have two genes and these two genes that we're considering, because we're doing a dihybrid cross, let's say these two genes are located on the same chromosome, very close to each other, like these two, gene one and gene two. In this scenario, we call these two genes linked, linked genes, okay? And we're gonna talk much more about that very shortly. Now, when two genes, if we're considering, let's say, gene one and gene four at the same time, guess what? They're located on different chromosomes. So when any two genes are located on different chromosomes or they're on the same chromosome, but very far apart, like gene one and gene three. They're located on the same chromosome, but very far apart. And either of these scenarios, when genes are very far apart on the same chromosome or on separate chromosomes, these, genes are, these two genes are said to be unlinked. But again, don't worry, we're gonna talk about these two concepts in much more detail now. Let's talk about linked genes first, because I think covering this one is a little bit easier. For access to our full-length premium videos and so much more, head over to teachme.org now.